This is the Mod Pod, brought to you by Modality, helping businesses optimize their Microsoft technologies everywhere. Hello and welcome to episode 10 of the Mod Pod this week. Joining us, we have Jamie Wielden, who is a Principal Solutions Architect, and Brett Shannon, who is Client Success and Transition Team Lead. Uh, and on today's Mod Pod, we're going to be talking about uh, how you integrate project management into service management, the challenges of implementing security into a cloud environment, and whether or not it matters who drives business transformation. So without uh, much more delay, let's crack on. Okay, so I guess where I land from uh, the integrating the two functions of project management and service Ah. management uh, stems from uh, I spent 10 or 11 years in a a large government organisation back in Australia. Very rigid waterfall project management uh, processes. Uh, I've spent most of my uh, working IT life in um, in the service management side and historically the two have sort of been disconnected so we did quite a bit of work way back then to try and work out the best way for project management and service management to meet in the middle so we've got project management going through there in a waterfall large organization they're fairly strict gate regime and approval processes however not completely understanding where they need to hand over and when they need to hand over to the service management team. So in, in essence, that's been a little bit of a, a, a pet project of mine ever since, uh, you know, from 10 or 15 years ago. So everywhere I've carried that on, I, I tend to see how how the, the project management function and the service management function can better align with each other. Okay. And it, it, is this coming from the angle that largely they just work as independent teams? Yeah, I I tend to rely a lot on the RACI model. Okay, so everyone knows the R and the A stand, you know, responsibility and accountability. I think the most ignored and neglected letter in the RACI model is the C, consulted. It it is just a matter of working out who does what and uh, understanding where those interactions are because you've got perfectly good function there, but there's two fundamental, they, they come at things from two fundamental different processes, yet the same, from the same outcome is to get a product or a new service into production for a, for a client in, in the best possible manner. However, the project managers uh, have a discrete um, uh, start and end date and they're delivering a simple product. Whereas the service management side, we're looking at it more holistically from a life cycle because we've got to nurture that product with the customer all the way along. And b- before I start, this isn't this isn't a uh, an anti project management uh, uh, stance. <laughs> you say that it, now, it depends how it, they listen to it, right? It, it's it, it's actually exactly the opposite, and, and I I hope that you know some of the some of the interactions we've been having we I say the transition team and managed services with the PM group it stands that out in the short time I've been with the company is that it, it is a matter of cooperation it's understanding and and letting each other know what they do because I have to understand what this project management function done did um, before I could sort of understand what we did and how we can better better align cool but it, it is a real challenge isn't it because I, I see this quite a lot having worked in the consultancy space for many years, you, you get some fantastic consultants who will come along and they'll they'll design the most perfect solution and you get these really detailed design documents and then they go like, ta-da, isn't it beautiful? There we go, all done. Um, <laughs> and then your operational teams goes, yeah, lovely. What do I do with it? Right? How do I feed it and water it? And how do I look after it? And what should I be doing on a daily, weekly, monthly basis to you know to keep it working? Um, and 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 you quite often see that 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 disconnect between those teams, right? Because um, those consultants just want to build it and aren't necessarily thinking about what happens next. 
Yeah, and I think, you know, from what you were saying there about the consultant will go and build it, one of the things we've been trying to do, and it, and it works with some customers, it doesn't work with other customers, is start that operational conversation at the pre-sales stage because you're absolutely right jamie it's like oh there must be loads and loads and loads of organizations who have gone yeah great we've put teams out there and we've been able to telephony and and then after that well actually you've got a beast that deals with not just telephony but it deals with all the other stuff and the security goes around it and the mobile devices and the andy 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 um so how do you if you come at that from a an, an incident management side how do you get across or how have you got across the kind of stuff that you need fed in at what points yeah so it's all about it's all about you and the thing you find when you have these discussions is everyone's on the same page everyone sort of has an idea of what needs to happen and who needs the input it's just it's just joining the dots together it's just that collaboration so I find, you know, and it's a catch-22 situation because any of the guys in support and operation, they're always busy. You, you never see anyone in support twiddling their thumbs waiting for work to come their way. So the challenge is getting the resources to input up the front. When I say up the front, that's in the strategy and design. So the strategy has got to be there is what products are we putting out now? And we're having those discussions at the moment around TSS and MSS. So, you know, what is the strategy of the product that we're trying to put out so therefore when you when you're developing the strategy and then that strategy moves into the design there should be a little voice from from operations to say well hang on we're going to need training on that we haven't got the skill sets there so before you send that through the design and the build phase we probably need to be looking at training because we could be getting a head start on the training while you guys are doing the design so you know from the support and the transition and the deployment side, we need to understand that if we want a better developed and designed product coming through, which is more fulsome and it's got capacity planning, it's got availability planning and it's got supportability built in, we have to sacrifice some of our time to make sure that we let the people that are designing it and, and the strategy knowing what it will take to support. Because... Um, Jamie's right. If it comes down and the support guys say, "Okay, thanks," well, you know, we have to go back up in there. And if we didn't ask for it in the first place, then you know, the guys don't know. They don't know what they don't know. So that's where again that C. So you know, the 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 design team and the strategy, they know what they're accountable for. They know what they're responsible for. But maybe a little bit more talking and collaboration and consulting with the other teams along the way. Okay. So for is is this something that is sort of specific really to um to partners and organizations like us, or do you think this goes wider into you know some of the actual clients who are delivering their own their own projects as well? Uh, I, unfortunately, my experience is across the board. So I've had a I've had a uh, as I said major government organization in Australia I worked with with for ten or eleven years. When I first came to, to to the UK, I worked with a large logistics firm. They had the same issue. I went from there and worked for a smaller software company that was in the logistics field, um, and they had the same issues. And, and and it's funny, it's the 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 same walls are there for a small company, uh, for a, a one or two person project team and service management. There was a clear wall down the middle. It was mm. we'll do this and then we'll give it to you. Um, it's not until you 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 have a view and have a discussion about the advantages of, well, if you just have a bit of a conversation with me before you go designing the scope. And look, project managers are in a, a bit of a catch-22 situation because sometimes uh, in larger organisations, they're tasked with developing the scope. And in some organisations, they're given the scope. So, and and I think where, where we are, we're, we're the, the latter of that. So, the, the project managers get given the opportunity or the project and say, there you go, off you go now and deliver. But they didn't have any input into the scope. So it's, you know, they're, they're 
for want of a better phrase, stuck with the scope. And if there's any changes that go forward, it's the project manager that then has to go back and 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 help define that scope if the if the scope wasn't 100% done. Ideally, the project manager would be involved in the scope creation, so they, they've got some input into what they're delivering. But certainly, you know, um, you know, it, it, it's across all shapes and sizes. There's it, it just takes a a willingness of both sides to say, hey, this is the way we do things. This is the way we do things. How do we make it fit together? Yeah, and I, and I think <clears throat> I mean Jamie, you, you've you've worked in large organisations. I've worked in large organisations. Yep. And I think the number of projects that I've been involved in over the years, there's there's been very few that have had the um, the operational sort of team involved in those early project discussions. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's my experience too. And and now certainly when when I'm starting a project or starting to work with a customer, one of the first things I'm trying trying to do because we're normally going in on a consultancy basis to deliver deliver a, a product, right? Either design mm. something, implement, do a migration, whatever it is. I, one of the things I try and make sure that I set really early is a, an expectation with the customer about what's needed outside of our delivery as a partner what what they need to bring to the to the table to ensure that the overall engagement is successful mm. because unless they're 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 uh, paying into that process as well unless they're committing and 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 thinking through the end-to-end -end process and flows and business impacts uh, whatever we do as a partner is is it's unlikely to be successful and deliver the business values because you know it needs that supporting ecosystem wrapped around it um, whether mm -hmm. that's operational stuff or you know security network engagement whatever it is there's there's all sorts of different departments within the customer that they need to bring to bring to the party as well to to make to make a project mm -hmm. successful the, the technology is largely irrelevant isn't it in this case cool lovely i think we've covered that one cool. Shall we move on to, to Jamie's Jamie's security question? So let's, let's cover copy two. Yeah, so um, security best practices in the cloud. Um, so yeah, this is something I thought would be really interesting to, to discuss on here. I, I speak to quite a lot of um, customers who are either part way through or, or think they've completed their migration to the cloud. Uh, most of them have, have been doing that at pace because of the pandemic and, you know, the, the motivation to enable people to work more securely from home. Um, and and I see a lot of organizations struggling with with security in the cloud. So I thought this would be a really interesting, interesting topic to discuss. Um, I guess most of those challenges seem to come in the in the shift um, from um, traditional security practices where customers would have their data you know in a data center behind a firewall in a locked room with security passes um, so you've got that concept of protecting the perimeter securing the perimeter and then what happens behind the castle walls? That that that's fine because you know you've got your you've got your castle walls and your moat and and your drawbridge and that's what's delivering your protection. Um, but obviously, when you shift to a, a cloud-based model, all of your data is out there. You know you, you you've got your data stored on on public cloud. It's connectable over the internet. You're authenticating, so you've got your corporate identities that again are are being used over a public network. Um, and that creates a real, a real different focus in terms of how you secure that and how you protect that, that data. Yeah. Yeah. And I think <clears throat> so I mean I've I've done various degrees of sort of security over the years and not to any degree that, you know, the likes of you and some of the other guys know, but um, you know, basic sort of principles and what you're talking about, the firewall, et cetera, there. If you've got that in some other uh, data center which has let's face it probably some fairly serious firewall uh, technology going on it does all then shift to 
who's trying to get to it and from what right yeah I, and I, I, I think there's a real big mental shift there in what you're securing because you know I was, I was having a conversation with this with somebody the other day and it's like well we could validate that it's me and we can validate that I'm allowed to access the data but if I'm doing it for my shonky old piece of junk at home which has got virtually no security on it you're just opening up a doorway in aren't you so I think each one of those three things the the, the who the what you know and, and from where type of thing absolutely yeah it's a big a big change for companies I don't think they see it like that at the moment a lot of them no no you, you, you're absolutely right and I see a lot of companies um, who who try to secure the cloud using old school methodologies so it's like okay well the the only access to the cloud is going to be via a secure VPN connection uh, express route something similar like that and yeah. all of our remote workers have to VPN into the office and then go out over over the secure connection the express route connection to the cloud obviously this is like so suboptimal in terms of network and performance flows and if you're using any real-time applications like teams or, or zoom or skype or whatever you, you're going to have serious problems with that um, and and again organizations are, are kind of fall into that trap because that's what they know um, rather than going out there and looking at the new cloud security model that perhaps they should be adopting yeah and I, and I guess it's also, <clears throat> in some respects, sort of comes back to tying in the previous conversation is you can get somebody in like us to review your security and come up with a strategy for you and tell you which boxes to tick or we'd tick them for you, whatever it may be. But from an operational perspective, that doesn't stop when we put our tools down and say, yes, we've done what we've said we'd do. That is an ongoing thing because you know, even if you take it at a really basic level of viruses, for example, yep. Yep. people don't stop creating new bits <laughs> of malware and viruses just because we've finished a piece of work, right? No, absolutely. And, and the threats uh, um, are becoming ever more complicated and clever and, and sneaky in how they're trying to get access to your data. Mm. Yeah, and putting everything on the cloud is is another vector for those guys to to attack you with. Um, but you're you're absolutely right in that operational process because obviously your internal security teams they need they need to adapt to 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 the new tools and the new methodology. So very much so when you're starting on this cloud-based journey, a bit like we were saying about dragging the incident management teams along, we absolutely need to make sure that we're that we're taking the, the, the security team and all of those security analysts on a similar journey um, and helping them through the design, the deployment process, understand um, why we're implementing things a certain way, what controls are gonna disappear, but also what new controls that they have that they can use instead. Um, and then you'll start working around that, you know, security analyst says no type response. Mm. Um, so does it, so Jamie, so from a, from a customer perspective, if they've made the decision to go to the cloud and they're, and they're setting up all this security, cloud security, they realize it's different than an on-prem on solution. Do they think that security is going to be easier? Because you've just mentioned upskilling their internal teams, because just like we're saying, if I get a new product to come through to deliver it into support, we have to look at the training liability for that product. So are most customers aware of the extra uh, skills liability when they go to the cloud? I, I don't think so, no. So. Uh, um, it's interesting. I was reading an IDC survey um, the other day that was talking about this, and it identified that the, the biggest security challenge in the cloud is insufficient expertise. You know, out of all the different IT companies that responded, um, I think there was 66% of respondents confirmed that, that that was their biggest challenge was was insufficient expertise in cloud-based security. Mm -hmm. Like when I'm talking to customers, they, they tend to fall into one of two camps. Um, you've either got 
you know, the bigger, medium enterprise size customers who've got a security team that are really worried about the cloud, don't really want to understand it, and therefore they just want to turn all the functionality off, um, which obviously massively impacts the user experience and then the business don't get the value that they need. Or you've got another, another set of customers that, um, that have bought into the cloud sales pitch and think that once they're migrated into the cloud, all of this functionality that they've paid very expensive licenses for is just there and it's just working for them and it's just doing magic and they don't have to they don't have to do anything they're just automatically protected in the cloud mm. um, and, and obviously the reality is somewhere in between you know you do need to apply a certain amount of configuration and control and implement new processes and workflows um, and if you do that correctly there's no reason why you can't give the users a feature rich environment similar to what they would have had you know on premise yeah i mean one of the one of the things that strikes me is you don't have to look back very far security in an awful lot of enterprises boiled down to physical security as you said of sort of all the data centers you can get in etc your accounts uh, so if you had access to what whether you're admin or you know anything like that but then beyond that, you pretty much had firewall and antivirus. I was, yeah, pretty much it. Yeah. And if you look at now, if you look at the M365 stack, and this is, you know, one of the things I was, I was sort of trying to get across to a customer only recently. Yes, okay, you've still got your identity management stuff that you can deal with. You've got your multi-factor authentication, but then you've got your labeling, your DLP, your IRM. <clears throat> you've got threat protection and detection. You've got uh, simulated attacks you've got you know what's actually happening to all of these things that are saying that actually jamie logged in in the uk 10 minutes ago and now he's trying to log in from somewhere out in you know in america's or asia's or whatever it is therefore it can't be him what's going I, yep. and there's so many products and services yes. that need to be turned on and looked at and that and i don't think people who have come from that legacy tend to particularly get that you know um maybe maybe the firewall stuff is kind of irrelevant i mean one one of the things i wanted to to throw at you guys was we have an an almost a never-ending conversation about this (laughs) this goes it goes on over months and months and months with some of the guys in the consulting team is if you've got everything in the cloud and i've only ever met one customer who has literally their ad and everything and they have nothing outside of the Microsoft arena or, you know, whatever it is. Do they need any other security at all? Do they need any firewalls in their office? Do they need any, because you access, it's like I'm working from here. I haven't particularly got anything clever on my network connection. Do I need that anymore? Is the firewall on-prem in the office, you know, eventually become a thing of the past, apart from where you have on-prem data centers? So yeah, it's a really good question. I think um, if you're able to live entirely within that ecosystem, um, and you know, for ninety percent of customers, that's probably a really big if. I, I don't think there's <laughs> yeah. many customers yeah. who are in that space. <laughs> Um, but I, I think if you are entirely in that ecosystem, you know, everything's in M365. All of your server-based applications are in Azure. Actually, there's a really good argument that says if you properly implement the Microsoft security stack, there is enough capability there um, to, to to protect all of those different services and capabilities. You know, mm. you, you've touched on some there. You know, in terms of the identity protection in Azure Active Directory and multi-factor authentication, but you've also got really advanced technology like um, the conditional access which gives you huge amounts of flexibility to control what data people are allowed to uh, access from which locations using which devices when they get prompted for uh, for MFA. So maybe if you're on a corporately owned device that's trusted, um, you're not prompted, but from a BYOD you are. There's there's huge amounts of complexity there that you Mm -hmm. can build up. And the same with DLP and data protection policies, Um, but probably um, but I think from a security perspective, one of the coolest capabilities within the Microsoft stack is actually um, Microsoft uh, Cloud App Security. And um, that gives you huge capability to monitor what uh, and how people are using IT systems 
um, but it also extends outside of the Microsoft world as well and into third party cloud applications. So you can monitor how many different shadow IT applications the business have downloaded, you know, got out their credit card, bought themselves and started using. Um, and how much of your sensitive corporate data is being transferred onto those third party platforms. Mm. And then you can control access to those platforms again, based on what, where, how they're being used by the users. So there's some great capability there to properly tighten down your environment and manage it um, and, and secure your secure your data. Because after all, you know, that's the most important thing to any organization, isn't it? It's your data. Cool. It's a, it's a real mind shift then, mindset shift. Definitely, definitely. So some of the, some of the things that I often find myself talking to customers about is um, you know, a couple of concepts when they're on that cloud journey. Um, the first one is um, apply your security controls as close to the data as you possibly can. So if you're storing data within a cloud platform, whether that's you know, M365, SharePoint, Teams, OneDrive, whatever, you want to be applying data security controls inside that environment. That way you're not bothered about which device people are using, whether they're coming from a corporate or a home network or sat in a Costa coffee shop, you know the data is secured at source where it lives. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's the first principle. Having you know, good identity and access management obviously is a default. Um, being able to understand your data. So making sure that you can classify your data, you know what's sensitive, what's internal, what can be shared, what can't. If, you, if you've got that kind of understanding of, of the data that you're storing, then you can start making intelligent decisions about what people are allowed to do with it. Um, and and the, last, the last principle is, is probably the most important, is one of adopting a, um, a mindset of zero trust. Yeah. So having that concept that you're living in the cloud, everything's publicly accessible, there are bad people out there who will be targeting you already. Um, so you need to adopt that mindset that I'm already under attack. I need to be monitoring for it. I need to be continuously managing my environment. I need to be hunting for, for threats and, and exposures um, and, and proactively taking charge of that rather than just the old school. I've got my firewalls in place. I'm just going to sit back and, um, and, and, and wait. You know, you, you, that zero trust model you need to be out there constantly managing that security excellent so paranoia is the way forward a little bit <laughs> instead of it'll be right mate yeah, yeah. exactly there we go <laughs> brilliant should we um should we jump on to the last topic then my my topic uh, for today is does it really matter who drives business transformation? Because let's face it, it's either coming from IT or it's coming from the business. But does it actually have a, an effect on how you deliver your project? Yeah, so I'm going to jump in and say, yes, of course, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. well, it's kind of a loaded question, really. <laughs> Um, yeah, so working with you know, loads of different customers and, and delivering transformation programs internally for large enterprises as well, um, my experience has always been that unless you've got strong business sponsorship, um, those transformation projects will, will, will not meet their expectations. Because it's it's really difficult without good business sponsorship and 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 that kind of push from the business side, it's really difficult to get the engagement that you need to properly deliver organisational change. I think you can deliver technology. I I think we were saying earlier, delivering the technology is the easy bit, right? Mm -hmm. um, but actually, to get the business to change how they work and how they use that technology, unless you've got that kind of business sponsorship, I, I, personally, my experiences, I found that really difficult to do. Yeah, hundred percent agree. So, in, in any transformation or any project or any change event, you've got uh, the, the three P's: the people, the pro process, and the products. And from an IT perspective, 
where the product. So there has to be that business strategy. I mean, um, it, it's no good us having a, a, a great new piece of technology if it doesn't fit with the business, uh, the, the business strategy. So, you know, the, the strategy should be all about the, the, the people and the, and the processes, because if you're implementing a great new bit of kit, what processes need to change? And if the people can't use that kit, then it's irrelevant anyway. So yeah, absolutely. It comes down to that neglected C in the racy. It's the collaboration, you know, and any business strategy that we're implementing, you'd hope that they'd be talking to the IT guys to make sure that the, 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 the suggested um, digital solution or the technical solutions fit for purpose. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I never, for a second thought it, <laughs> it was you know uh, going to be the other way around um i think what is interesting though is there are projects where the it teams are looking for the new technology they're looking to get rid of skype and maybe you know possibly in some of the some of the sort of smaller mid-range businesses i guess um you know that they're looking at okay well somebody's turning off my skype service or um you know i need to move to teams or whatever it is they're looking at it from a very technology driven perspective um the ability to push that conversation back up the business tree is quite hard sometimes i think yeah if you I'm, haven't got it coming from the business yeah, definitely. And and I've seen that too. Like, it's not that IT can't drive these programs, because um, I think some IT departments absolutely can. Mm. But, but if that, if whoever's driving that program, if IT are driving that program, if they're not able to get business sponsorship and engagement, um, that's when things will start to struggle in terms of delivering business change, I, I think. So you kind of need someone who's able to have um, a, a good conversation with the business in, in terms that the business can understand. And um, let's face it, sometimes that can be a struggle for IT, um, IT chaps. We, we're, we're not the best at having plain English conversations. There's very often too much jargon, too much technology. Um, and, and I think that can often be a challenge when programs are being driven by IT is it, it becomes much more about the technology rather than about the business value. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, yeah, and it doesn't mean that if the if the IT organisation is sees the, the writing on the wall and wants to be proactive and get out in front, even if it's the tail wagging the dog and we go to the business and present the scenario and the solution and the, the, uh, the advantages, um, you know, it's not to say that we can't have proactive input into a business strategy that the business wasn't aware of. And that's that's probably the remit of the IT organisation as well. It's informing the business of what the capabilities and the possibilities are. But but that has to go back up and the business has to have the 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 the, the chance to build that into whatever the overall business strategy is, even if it is identified and proactive from the IT organization, it still has to fit into the business strategy. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Feels like a very simple one to have answered that. Yeah, hey, right, so yeah. I th I th 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 business transformation I think, easy, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, we do an awful lot of stuff with adoption and change management, obviously. And, you know, the first thing in there is make sure you've got a decent executive or, or business sponsor. Um, I think, where you do get that definitely from a project perspective it makes a huge difference on on how quickly people move and how well decisions are made and um you know getting the the necessary resources in on that project i think if you try and drive it from the other way you know yes if you can get the message across to the business to go actually we need to change this because this is happening and this is what's going to be the effect on it therefore it's a something that needs to be addressed that's cool if it's just seen as Oh, that's the bit of shiny kit over there. Can we try that? You're going to be yeah, on the which, hot meter. Which, which isn't unknown to happen, that IT have been maybe guilty of saying it is shiny, so so let's do it. But it's got to have the right input into the business. Yeah. Well, I, think, I, think, I think if you if you don't sell the business value, you, you, you're doing yourself a disservice anyway, you know. But... Because the business will look at what you're doing and, and say, oh, OK, they're, they're replacing, for instance, Skype for business, end of life, they're moving to Teams. 
you know, this is just a, a supportability thing. Therefore, your budget that you will get will be based around that because there's no perceived value to the business. Whereas if you can talk to the business and say, well, actually, this is transformative. These are all of the business benefits and the value to you that you will have from this migration. It then becomes much more than the product swap out. It becomes about actually enabling the various different teams and departments to work more efficiently, generate more revenue, whatever. And suddenly your program will have much more revenue to spend to do the job properly. Um, and you'll be much more successful to deliver you know, proper proper organizational change. Cool. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. That's, that's The time has gone already. Good. Good to be good. <laughs> Didn't you enjoy it? No, it was good. I said not good at the time. Oh, right. Okay. No, it was good. Yeah. 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 Breathing a sigh of relief. Great note to end on, wasn't it? Yeah, I'm glad that's over. <laughs> <Good neck. laughs> right. Uh, thank you again, both. Uh, that was Jamie Wielden, Principal Solution Architect, uh, Brett Shannon, who is Client Success and Transition Team Lead. Uh, and we will be back for episode 11 in a couple of weeks' time. Thanks, gents. Thanks, all. This is the Mod Pod, brought to you by Modality, helping businesses optimize their Microsoft technologies everywhere.